you guys are in for a treat. This is going to be another great one. We've had some great authors on, and we've got another great author. This is our author spotlight. Um, we don't want to take away from our regular episodes. We'd like to give a spotlight just for the author, and this one's going to be great because we have some tie-ins um, with this next person she doesn't know about yet, but uh, I'm going to have to make them up because now it sounds mysterious. So, hey, we want to welcome. She's written a fantastic book called Behold the Most Monster, Confronting America's Most Prolific Serial Killer. Welcome, Jillian Lauren. Thank you so much for having me. And I like good mystery. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to hear what our, what our degrees of separation are. Just an honor to have you on here. And the, uh, the book that you wrote about this individual we're going to talk about is unbelievable. Unbelievable. Thank you. And it's an honor to be here with the two of you. And like I said, someday maybe I'll have a chance to interview both of you. <laughs> well, so, so first of all, the tie-in is I've been a huge Michael Connolly fan. I've read the entire Bosch series. I've read a lot of the other stuff. I listened to the podcast, uh, the murder book about this. I watched the Netflix special, I believe it was, right? Um uh, it, it, it's streaming kind of everywhere. It was stars. Every now, yeah, but I think it was yeah. for, but I watched that. So, um, we actually had as one of our guests it's on here, Dave Wright. Confronting a Serial Killer. And confronting a Serial Killer. It. Yeah. So one of our guests we had on previously, I think it was episode 13 was Dave Reichert. He was the lead investigator for the Green River Killer. Yes. And um, and so we talked with him and then one of our guests, his episode is going to be coming back out. Um, uh, the serial killer from up in Alaska it was Israel Keys. We, we so this, believe it or not, the DEA agent's name is Rick Rambo. Rambo is his real name. <laughs> Right. Um, you know, my, my uncle John was a cop in Toledo and uh, and they said uh, they used to call him Ram Jack. And I was just like, Uncle John, that sounds a little bit like you're a gay porno <laughs> star. And he was like, no, it was a, it was a combination of Rambo and Kojak. It was like it was a compliment. <laughs> All righty. That's anyway, a story he's sticking to it, right? <laughs> um yeah all right so rambo let's go yeah rambo well and, and he he actually ended up walking by keys and didn't realize it but he said there was something wrong about him there was something mm -hmm. just something about him and there's these people there is there is something about him uh dave Riker got to meet ted bundy they went down and interviewed him and you know um uh, watched i mean I, I used to teach behavior analysis and interview and interrogation and went through mm -hmm. the fbi course and just knowing what evil is out there so I, I was glad you wrote this book because you come from a unique perspective in terms of writing this book you weren't exactly a crime writer to start off with and so your, your story's out there her site is uh, jillian lauren j-i-l-l-i-a-n lauren l-a-u-r-e-n.com go there i, I don't want to go through your entire history because it's there for folks to read but Suffice it to say, where you started and where you ended up were like almost opposite ends of the spectrum. In some ways, yes. But, you know, like you can look at all, all my books of the very varying subject matter, let, let us just say. And, and um, you know, this definitely isn't my first foray into crime, but wow, was it a plunge into the cold water to all of a sudden be in the middle of a multi-jurisdictional national investigation and see what that was like. So I learned a tremendous amount. I think what's unusual between, uh, you, you know, comparing my book to most true crime books is, yes, like the author isn't coming from such a beginner's mind. You know, it wasn't entirely beginner's mind, but I hadn't really written much true crime before. Things I had, you know, I'd interviewed people for fiction pieces or short stories. Um, but to really start digging into law, digging into, um, you know, the history of the criminal justice system and, um, uh, you know, advances in forensics and, you know, it was like, I was just a sponge and I, and I hope that that beginner's passion and beginner's enthusiasm, like comes through on the pages because I, I hope to be taking people through the journey with me, mm -hmm. you, you know, in which they're learning these same things that I'm learning. And I, I think that, you know, most civilians don't know them. Well, I'm looking at your book here on uh, on Amazon. I see that it's rated as the best new true crime nonfiction book. That's pretty. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> That's pretty yes, prolific it, in itself. I know, and it's been you know it's really been um, 
just like growing and growing, which is, isn't always the case sometimes when you have a splashy title and a splashy idea. And this certainly was a splashy idea. Be careful what you ask for Mm -hmm. if you're someone with splashy ideas. Um, But uh, that it's really like started to take a hold in like communities of victims who are reaching out to me and asking me how and where do I go and what do I do? And I'm starting to learn now I have a different learning curve, right? Rather than figure out how to learn to read an investigation report, um, or, you know, an investigation chronology, um, you know, now I'm learning how to like where you go afterwards, you know, like how do I talk to these women who are, you know, are are victims of violent crime who reach out to me now. So, um, that has been, you know, obviously, uh, also painful, but incredibly, um, I don't know, useful and empowering and inspiring experience. I'm looking forward to see where where I take it next. Well, let's talk about how did you, so how did you get started? How did you get started down the path of Samuel Little? Like, you know, Samuel Little, I mean, up until Gary Ridgway, uh, the Green River Killer, he was the most prolific serial killer out there. And Samuel Little, um, obviously, significantly exceeded that. And we're not into body counts. It's not like they are, by the way, they are to them. It was about body counts. Right. But I don't want to make it sound like, well, you know, he held the record, but how did you get involved in this thing? Uh, and how did this start for you? Like I said, considering the type of books you write, you know, and where you come from, and then you've got this one out of the gate. This, I mean, this is like going into your backyard, putting a shovel in the ground. And the minute you do, you know, you, you're, you know, you're, you're Beverly, like, Hillbilly, you're she like, Beverly Hillbilly. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it was absolutely what it was like. I was uh, working on a proper mystery novel. I too is a huge fan of Michael Conley and he is, he's a mentor figure to me. Uh, that's how I poached his cops. That's how that, that's how his, the fictional cops, you know, Harry Bosch and Renee Ballard, the actual cops that those those characters were based on are in my book. Um, so, you know, Michael was very helpful to me as I was starting out. And I scored this interview with Mitzi Roberts. Detective Mitzi Roberts, who is Renee Ballard. She's the Renee Ballard character. And she is a very sexy Los Angeles detective and very hard to get an interview with. But, you know, on Mike's recommendation, she took it and I interviewed her. It was fascinating. It was amazing. It was procedural. I had an idea of a story I wanted to write. And I said, you know, oh, you know, as we were leaving, what are you the most proud of? It's a nice way to end an interview. You know, especially if you got into some gory stuff, right? And she said, well, I'm proud of them all, but I caught a serial killer once, and that was pretty cool. And I was like, and that's I, kind of a jaw-dropping moment after I all of this stuff. How did I the lead? <laughs> uh, I know you're looking at, like, the watery remains of your iced tea, just going, knowing that she's, like, looking at her watch, you know? And fully, like, in badge gun, she's just, like, taking a break to have some lunch. And I was just like, well... Uh, you know, I buried the lead here and she said, I wasn't the one asking the questions. And anyway, what I did get out of her then was, you know, that, that in uh, 2013, due to a a grant from the Department of Justice that was helping fund cold case departments to run old evidence, you know, to run evidence from the 80s and the 90s that, you know, in, when we didn't have the forensic technology we do now, uh, they got a hit, they got two hits, they got three hits. And, um, and that's the very, very short version of a long and hopefully incredible, enjoyable book. <laughs> um, my book, um, Behold the Monster. But um, I said, I'm going to be the one who gets people to pay attention to this case. I didn't say I'm going to go in and solve murders. I, d- I wasn't a citizen detective. I didn't, you know, have that particular tool set. I, you know, I, I mean, I've always been like sort of an amateur Nancy Drew in my own head, but, um, and a critical thinker and just somebody who's hasn't that obsessive curiosity. So I was primed for the pump for this to come at me, you know? And, uh, and I was like, I'm just going to bring attention to it. I'm going to write my first like true crime reportage, 8,000 words, New York magazine, 
boom, all of a sudden everyone's going to care about these marginalized victims that were ignored the first time around. And, you know, I've done my good deed for the next six months. And I also have this amazing story. And then what happened was, you know, five years later, here I am sitting with you and it's been, um, you know, it, it's been such a ride, but that was, that was my end. My end was Mitzi. How far into the process were you before you realized how, or did you realize how big this was going to be? Because it's one thing to say, okay, got a serial killer. Technically, the definition of a serial killer is two or more. The FBI has kind of dropped it down. Used to be three. They, they, oh, they dropped yeah, it. It used okay. to be three, then, it, then it's two, right? Separated by time, you know, mm-hmm. cooling down period, et cetera. So when you were thinking this, you're saying, okay, serial killer, what, you know, three or four. Um, when did When did it hit you about the enormity of who and what you were talking about? Well, I went, I, so I exchanged letters with him. That's how I, you know, I got my visitor clearance, you got to get it from him. So, uh, I, you know, I said, I'm, I'm interested in your case. I think it's been largely overlooked. You know, he's no Ted Bundy. I mean, he's an 80 year old black man and he's, you know, he doesn't catch the, he killed women, people don't particularly relate to or care about, you know, the uh, criminalist Stephen Eggers referred to them as the less dead, the population of women that people care about way less than they do say, you know, the governor's daughter gets lost on spring break. She's the most dead. A black drug addicted prostitute is the least dead. Which, so which is one of the I reasons he was able to write, get away with this for get so away long with because it again and again, didn't but hit the I radar. Mean, yeah. How many again and agains, you know, I, I had no idea. I was, I had done all my reading. I read all the Bundy interviews, which were brilliant that uh, Ainsworth and Michaud did. Um, and, uh, you know, I had studied the Green River Killer and that conversation that, that finally led to his arrest, which was Bundy finally told them to find a fresh body and wait. And that he'd come back, and he did. Uh, yeah. So that was the one I know. Isn't that fascinating? That was mm-hmm. the one piece of information. So I think that's what sort of uh, that kind of dynamic, you know, that one piece of information that turns the whole thing around really got me. And that's when I started, you know, pursuing the story. I got the book deal. I started pursuing the story in earnest. I started traveling around the country, meeting families, the victims, um, hey, living real quick victims. before you get too far into that. And, oh, oh. how would I re- respond to the number was the question. Well, so the whole first day he lied to me. Six months of writing letters. And he was innocent, innocent, innocent. His upside down case. He's just a man who wound up at the wrong place at the wrong time. With his he DNA all be, over the victims. Had DNA yeah. all over. These victims who often have multiple DNA profiles on their body, they're prostitutes. You know, there are, there are many reasons that make this difficult. But in any case, uh, it was the second day. And I was like, I'm driving out to Lancaster prison at four in the mor- morning and like, waiting seven hours to go to a men's maximum security prison, like, and go in those bathrooms and, you know, and like sit there and have him bullshit me to my face. Like I was like, I'll go one day. I'll go maybe two days. I was like, but by the end of that second day, I was like, I'm out. Like, I'm not doing this again. You know, I I was just like, I'm not writing a book about someone who's just lying. Um, And then it turned out that he was getting ready to confess. I mean, I think that a lot of people put emphasis on some magic power I had. And I think it was, it was a perfect storm. I don't mean to underestimate myself or how, like, I think I have a grasp of psychopaths that um, people who maybe haven't come into contact with the ones that I have um, don't have. You know, I realize that I'm talking to somebody who is thinking differently than I am. I'm about six hours. And at the end of that six hours, I was like, this is it. If I go home today with nothing and he's still innocent. uh, And right 
is sort of near the end, you know, he was like, I want a TV, all these bitches, all these people. Come. Can I say that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I'd be Just saying, pretend you're in the squad room. Oh, God, really? Okay. Yeah, that that's, was quite a squad room with Sam Little with all the people coming in and talking to him. Oh, my gosh. Um, but uh, in any case, like when he started to confess to me, I learned during the confessions that he was getting ready to to confess to this Texas Ranger who had talked him into it, said he would get, you know, better treatment, better. He, he hates California. He believes he's victimized here. This Texas Ranger's name is uh, R- Ranger James Holland. It has a, a way with serial killers it's nationally famous for it. So we got a Texas case and went in there. And so so he and I sort of descended upon the same underreported serial killer at the same time. And you can imagine as former law enforcement, like how would you feel if you had this big case that no one knew about and all of a sudden here's obnoxious me? Like just like with my heels dug in going, I totally know, (laughs) like, I know what you're doing. I know about this whole investigation. Like he's talking to me too. And, uh, and he was like, young lady, I prefer if you'd stay in your lane, you know, thank you very much for your help. And will you now step out of the way? And I was like, that's actually not how a free press works. (laughs) So it's going to be difficult. And the devil makes three. Yeah, and that's a difficult position to be in too. At the end of the day, yeah. it's, you know, it's really about finding the truth, right? And if right. somebody can help you find the truth and close the case, you kind of have to put your ego to the side and go, look, it's not about me; it's about the victims. Exactly, exactly what you're talking about earlier. And it's, it's difficult for all of there. us. Yeah. You know, they're trusting me not to blow, you know, not to contaminate their case and like blow up some giant serial killer investigation. That, you know, I mean, before this, he was. He was incarcerated for three murders. There was no, I mean, when he started to talk to me and it was like in such exquisite detail and it was one, it was two, it was three, it was four, it was five, it was six the first day. And the next weekend I went back and like, I think it got up to 23 before the investigation was so intense and, and detectives were coming in all the time. I backed off like talking about the cases too much because I, d- I really didn't want to confuse the investigation, you know? And, and I felt like I was going to, you know, my job was to be an observer. Did you believe him at that point? I did. I, I, you know, I didn't at first, but as I began to start to see the cases be put together, yeah. And as I, you know, and also, I mean, I had a unique, I had a unique opportunity, which is I had a long term relationship with this subject, you know, so that we were able to, like, I was able to sort of like wade through the initial lies that you're going to be dealing with every minute of a conversation with a psychopath, you know, and the original transactions. And then I was able to prove myself to him as being trustful. A trustworthy, you know, not trustful. I was not, nor should I have been, but <laughs> that I was trustworthy. I did what I said I was going to do, you know. And and I mean, the thing that tipped the scales, you know, was actually my brilliant psycho uh, telekinesis. No, just kidding. It was, um, <laughs> it was. You know, he said I want a TV, and I was like, I also want things. I told him exactly what I wanted. I want a book. I'm, I'm, I said, I wrote, I'm writing a book about violent behavior. It's, you know, I didn't say serial killers. Um, I'm writing a book about violent behavior. I think you could illuminate a lot. You know, there's certainly a lot of violent behavior in your past, whether or not, you know, you were just unlucky with these prostitutes. Um, I'm sorry. Sometimes it's still this story's hard to talk about. I wrote about it, but you know, and and that I can do now. But like when I'm in, I get lost a little bit sometimes in the in the memories of the story. Do you know what I'm just saying? Well, there's More how many cases? Ninety three, and I have an incredible memory, which is part of like how I got 
you know, part of how I started doing this. I have a really, really good memory. I was like a memory. <laughs> I was like a card counter when I was a kid. Um, I mean, I have to train it. I have to do it, but I was able to do that. And that was one of the reasons I was able to help um, with this. But, um, you know, Sam Little, I do believe he was telling the truth to the best of his ability. You know, when he... He, he told me between 84 and 86 was the first number he ever gave me. And I still think it's probably that. The amount of confessions is 93. Do you think that's it, though? Do you think there's more? More than 93? No. Yeah. I don't. Oh, we'll never know. He died. Yeah. He did. I do think that we kind of... I mean, there was this race, there was this feeling of, I mean, talk about, you know, the way that, you know, people like this, like, upend the lives of everyone they come into contact with. It's like, you know, really walking to the edge of the abyss. Um, But, you know, I mean, I I have a family. And, uh, you know, people waiting, you know, like there's a car waiting to take us to dinner and I'm on the phone with a serial killer. So how do you walk up to the edge of the abyss? Uh, And, you know, like they say, you know, it's one of those philosophical things, too, but it's a moral dilemma. How do you walk up to the edge of the abyss without falling into it yourself, you know, without getting so consumed by it that it takes over the rest of your life? I'm sort of bad at that. (laughs) <laughs> type of thing. <laughs> so I think that the book, you know, is in many ways um, an exploration of that too, you know, like my uh, my sense of responsibility and how consumed I got with this story as, as a victim of domestic violence and as somebody who, you know, was running on an engine of, you know, like, Yes, justice and objectivity, but also, you know, sort of a personal fire and a personal kind of outrage um, that I, th- I think made it uh, emotionally, um, I don't know, I-, I hope, you know, really dynamic. You know, I, I can't imagine the uh, mental toll this must have taken on you because, you know, looking at your manuscript, right there at the very beginning, you have four. And, you know, when we, when you write a book, this is for whoever you want to dedicate the book to. And you list every victim on there. I, you know, I was a cop for 38 years. I can't imagine what psychological toll that had on you. Um, you know, I think the good Lord gives us all abilities to handle certain things. And apparently, <laughs> one of your gifts is you can handle this type of interview. And, and it doesn't get any darker than this. You know, the the interviews were fascinating for me and the thing about little is uh, you know there was definitely like I knew there was a cost and that it wasn't like a little cost you know and it wasn't a temporary cost you know that there was just something by like really spending time with somebody who the only pleasure they could get in life was taking the life of another person and hearing what that felt like and hearing what that sounded like and hearing what it, you know, uh, um, all the rest of it. And, um, you know, that I'll never be the same person, um, that I was when I, when I picked up that story, but, um, it's also given me a, a great sense of meaning. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think that that's, um, you know, everyone's always like, I'm, oh, I want to be happy. I want to be happy in life. I want to be happy. And I was like, eh. I think that's like a stretch for me. <laughs> if I wanted to be happy all the time. But if I have a sense of meaning and a sense of purpose, then I have a reason to open my eyes in the morning. And this certainly gave me that. Well, and, and you know, there's a lot of people talk whether finding out what really happened brings closure or not to the families. I, I would certainly, I haven't experienced this, thank the good man, but um, I would certainly think that your work had a lot to do with getting him to open up, you know, the based on the things I've read so far and the research we've done. And I, I do believe that you had a big hand in bringing closure to a lot of these families. Maybe not all of them, maybe not all of them, maybe they credit the police. But the fact that you were able to get him to talk about things that he wouldn't tell anybody else about. Right. And, and also sometimes just caught the odd detail. You know, every time someone tells a story, they're, 
You know, in Omaha, I, I just caught the detail that, you know, he said he was behind a factory that was abandoned and it smelled really bad. Um, and that he left the victim in uh, upside down naked in a barrel. And they were able to locate that murder in 1974 in Omaha within two days because it was behind an old tannery. So, of course, it stunk. And then, you know, just the way that the location of the body, the way the the body was arranged, um, you know, I mean, there was nothing like that within a um, five-year span in Omaha beyond that one. So, yeah. Let me go back and ask a question. This has been one of my pet theories. I, I don't believe in closure, and I'll tell you why, because I don't think you can ever get somebody back to the way it was the day before. I think you can get resolution. I think you can bring things um, you can, you can give them finality, but, um, did, I mean, with, with talking with these victims, did any of them actually ever feel a sense of closure or was it more just relief? They have, they have some answers because look, you can't go back to the way it was the day before. It's different for everybody. Um, the person who I'm closest with, um, actually is a high ranking position, and, um, and that she works at the DOJ. Uh, she went like completely different direction from her sister. Um, you know, her sister, they, they danced on soul train together as teenagers and her sister went and went I off into soul that train. life, right? <laughs> and she went. She went and joined the military and, and, and has a military career. And, um, uh, and I'm very close with her and, and their family. And, you know, and no, there, there's no closure, but I do believe there's justice. And also the one thing that she said to me, her name is Debbie, um, and she's the sister of Alice, who's a victim who's, um, case I had a, a, a strong involvement with, um, both in my interviews with Sam and just me going out there and working the field, you know, just pounding the pavement old school and talking to people and, you know, following his directions and going back to him. And, um, in any case, so Debbie and I are very close and she said to me, you know, I, I knew my sister, you know, was not going to live to be 60. I knew that much about her, you know, and she said, at like, I don't have to worry anymore if she's okay, because now I know that she is, you know, and that's every, everyone's personal, you know, religious beliefs are theirs, but, you know, like to be able to give her, it's not like closure, but answers and, you know, and hopefully justice. I mean, that, that's something I think we can quantifiably say we can seek something you know? was achieved you have a you have a resolution to a case hey let me ask you let's talk about a typical day of talking to sam little once you once you got past all the bs once you got to the point of where you say we've got a working relationship here um because there has to be a you know you don't get to be a serial killer without being an expert at manipulation so there has to be a lot of that going on how did how does it how did a typical day once you started getting into this and going through the cases? What did a typical day look like working with Sam? You know, tell us about showing up, getting set up. You know, how did it go? What did he want? I mean, was this always a constant bargaining, or did you finally achieve? Okay, we're past all of that. Let's just talk. It was always constant bargaining, always, but not like it wasn't always the bargaining for the TV. That was just the first one. You know, he said, "I want a TV." I said, "I want things too." He said, are you going to buy me one? I said, I don't know, am I? And he said, what do you want to know about? Fine. You want to know about the first one? You know, it was Miami around the new year in 1971. And I was just like, wait a second. What? Did I just, did I just do that? Did it, did that just happen? And then as it rolled and then and numbers started to get larger, I was like, what have I gotten? myself into but basically so i mean you know every day had had i mean it's not just him it's you know i'm talking to multiple law enforcement officers and victims families and you know i mean if i took the world on what sam little said you know i i'd have written a whole book on on the information of one source who is a a 
super duper practiced liar, a murderer, thief, you know? So I, I checked out all his stories and, you know, and, and took a very broad kind of perspective at the beginning. And, uh, so that it, it was a lot of that more than it was talking to Sam at first, but it was always letters, you know, and he was very like, you know, I had to be like three letters a week. And, um, and then I visited him every weekend at the beginning, you know, Saturday and Sunday, missing my kids, soccer games, worst mom in the world, really worst mom award, show up late to the birthday party because you were in prison. Um, <laughs> it, it all depends on how you present you know, And then the documentary came out uh, confronting a serial killer directed by Joe Berlinger. And, uh, and all the people who were at those birthday parties were like, wait a second. You were, you were for real. I was like, no, yeah, I was for real. I was, I arrived late because I was coming from maximum security prison. It was a long day. Did that change your relationship with some of the other moms? They're going, wait a minute, you've been hanging around a serial killer? Wait a minute. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, my first memoir is about uh, the affair I had with the Prince of Brunei when I was still a teenager. So, you know, if that one didn't throw him off, then hopefully. <laughs> Talk about name one. dropping. <laughs> <laughs> that was Some Girls, right? That was called Some Girls, My Life in the Harem. Yeah. And, you know, and th that also had an element of crime to it. Sure. Um, unless you don't consider sex trafficking and crime. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, so, you know, I'm, I'm used to, uh, I don't know. I, I always remember there was a line in the Elvira movie where, you know, someone said, I'm sorry, I was, I was taken aback by your appearance. And she goes, that's okay. Everyone's taken aback by my appearance. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and I sort of thought the same thing. I was like, you know, I go to the party and I said, yeah, you know, I was just talking to the most prolific serial killer in American history. And they're like, I will be going and talking to the other women over there. Does data entry at, the <laughs> <laughs> at Citibank? Cause I have no idea what you're talking about. And then the documentary comes out of the book comes out and they're all like, Oh wow. She was telling the truth, but there's just no way. <laughs> <laughs> That's unbelievable. There's no way to make it sound less sort of, I mean, other than just to say, you know, like we're highly adaptive creatures. My life is my life. You two were in, in very uh, like high stakes law enforcement. So I think, you know, the kind of, um, I don't know, there's a personality that like where you have, you get the hunger for like the hunt and then, and the adrenaline and you, you can't let up and you get so devoted to the victims, you know? And, um, you know, and I, I really had that experience throughout writing this book. Yeah. And it becomes, I mean, what you just described there, it, it, it is no longer a career. It becomes a lifestyle. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but they become your family. It's like, look, here's Deborah's sister, Alice, you know, like as a baby, I keep her on my desk. You know, because when I'm like, eh, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm sick of working. I'm saying, Alice is here like, really? You sick of working? <laughs> I think you better sit back down and get to work. Because, you know, I made a difference for her and I made a difference for her family. So she sits here. She sits here for when I'm lazy. <laughs> hey, so at wh when and how and wh who, how did it come about finding out that Sam had this ability to draw the way he did and recall and create these, um, you know, basically he's a, he's a sketch artist. You know, he's sketching out mm -hmm. things for you to, to be able to uh, link people, you know, to the cases. How did that come about discovering that? Was that something that happened before you got involved or is that something that happened while you were involved? Well, I mean, Sam has been, like I said, he, he has a rap sheet that I, I have met many law enforcement officers throughout this and no one has seen anything like it. It's like he was arrested every other day somewhere, you know, often just for petty theft. He told me, you know, he had, he had everyone fooled, um, you know, that he, they thought he was just, you know, that he was just stealing steaks from the Walmart and then they'd let him out and he'd go and he'd kill that night and then go to the next city. Um, and will you remind me of your question? <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, no, it was just more about the um, his ability to draw and his ability to. Um, oh, the drawing. Yeah. Um. So Sam learned. To, so Sam has been incarcerated for much of his life, where he learned to draw, um, which is a really great skill to have because you say you can draw pictures of the guards' kids. They can send. Uh, right now, you have a skill that is. Um, that's valuable when you're incarcerated. Uh, and he fought, he was a boxer. Um, so, you know, he said, I only did two things well in life. I fought and I, I drew. And so, um, he had drawings all over his wall. So the law enforcement officers knew that he drew, you know, the sheriff's deputies knew that he drew, um, you know, some were victims, some were, uh, Tony Braxton, Condoleezza Rice. I mean, <laughs> I was just like, really? <laughs> just sometimes you have to laugh. You know, I'm going through these pictures and it's, you know, I'm trying to figure out, I'm like, is this a victim or is it Madonna? You know, and then it's like, Sometimes it gives you a clue, and right, and so under one, I was like, "Is this a victim?" And it said, "No, this is Condoleezza Rice, my dream." Did anyone ever determine if there was any uh, real lookalikes of the the? Yes. Oh gosh, yes. I mean, that was the thing, you know, Sam. I mean, there have been numerous serial killers who have drawn, you know, and there's most famously Henry Lee Lucas, uh, whose confessions were largely discredited. So oh, that was such a bogus thing. I am so pissed. Uh, I mean, I love the Texas Rangers. I love the law enforcement. But anytime you put a book in front of somebody and say, were you here and did it look like this? And then he regurgitates the facts back to you. Oh, yeah, I was here and it did this. They were looking for they were looking for the quick closure, the easy closures. And it's like, right. and so the Texas Rangers, believe me, are like super sensitive about that. Oh yes, we know. <laughs> so they were very careful. Like as I watched the investigation, they were very careful. They weren't feeding him anything. They were, you know, and, and the pictures he drew, yes, they were helpful. And you know, sometimes in, in connecting, um, uh, you know, connecting cold cases and connecting Jane Doe's missing persons with Sam's victims. Um, some of the likenesses are stunning. Yeah, I, I Googled him and, and you can see the ones that they've posted. It looks like there's about 18 on here. And in the back of my book, um, I have the, as far as I know, the only comprehensive list of Sam's victims, both solved, unsolved, and there were four living victims now only one but um out of the 90 out of all of his victims uh how many how many have been identified 63 to date i think it was 60 when i wrote the book but 63 to date and there was one last week and you know i have this map that i've had since the beginning that like really old fashioned where i put the pins in um, just to give me something tactile because a number like 93 starts to just dissolve in front of your face. You're just like, I don't even know what that means anymore. I was trying to picture 93 houses in a row and, and, and all the people who were affected by the ripple effect of that multiple generations, then of foster care and crime and abuse, you know? Um, and, uh, in any case, so I got to I put put the pins. The pins are red. If they're unsolved, I put a black pin of itself. So I got to change a pin last week, which doesn't happen very often anymore, but um, is always like a tiny miracle. Well, that's what we found out when we interviewed Dave Riker. We talked with him afterwards later, too. Some of the Green River Killer victims, I mean, they've, they've still been identifying some of them or locating them. And so it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things. It's a, it's the, the case is never over. You might have somebody in custody. They might be in prison, but it's never over, especially when you have unidentified victims. How about you, though? Um when did this get to the point to where you, did you reach a point, because you kind of alluded to it, did you reach a point to go, what the hell am I doing here? What am I doing talking to this guy? I mean, um, did did anything creep you out kind of the way Ed Kemper, you know, if you remember watching, you know, yeah. being in the room alone, 
Ed Kemper could have killed you with just bare hands. You know, Samuel, like I said, getting older, uh, he's more manipulative. Did you know? Did you ever get to the point, kind of go, what am I doing here? Did you ever want to quit? I mean, what kept you going in addition to the victims? You know, uh, Sam was, you know, uh, Gary Ridgway was a, a not particularly charming Green River killer, but many of them were. And Sam was very charming in that way uh, as well. And most of the time just felt like, you know, I, I had three names for him. I called him Perv Grandpa, Three Card Monty, and Snake Monster. These are these distinct sort of personalities I saw. That's not from a diagnostician. That's just from an observational perspective. Um, but when Snake Monster reared its head, I mean, yeah, he was an old man. Like he was, he did squats and push ups and sit ups in his cell till the day, I mean, till the day I didn't speak to him anymore, which was when he went into the infirmary for COVID. And he was there for 10 days and, and he died. Um, yeah, in de December of 2020. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I so needed it to be over, and I was also, like, in this race against time, knowing that he was dying and that, you know, this, that, that he was the last resource for, you know, many of these, you know, there would never be physical evidence discovered. There was no, you know, physical evidence in the first place. Um, and so... Uh, you know, I had a lot of mixed feelings about that. And then, you know, if you're going to do this right, like, you know, this, this sort of this, the magical talent I have of talking to psychos um, or really anyone, like I could talk to your grandma in an airport somewhere and <laughs> be all tattooed. I swear we'll be best friends by the time we get off that plane, you know, um, so it's not just serial killers. I just have a way, I, I, I can sort of make him feel not judged for that moment. Even though I'm telling him, you know, I am judging you. <laughs> just so you know, I'm not pretending I think you're awesome. But, but I would say things like, like the way I would flatter him is you did an exceptional thing. This is an exceptional thing. I mean, who else has done this? It's not saying like, I think you're really cool because you did this thing. It's, you know, I was like, you know, so do you want to just like go to the grave unknown for this, you know, uh, massive achievement of yours? Well, you're playing the ego. Like that's what, right. they, that's what drives a lot of these guys. Did you ever, when you were sitting there with him, because you, you, your title, Behold the Monster, a, definitely a monster. When you said like you had um, um, uh, the three distinct personalities, did you feel the sense of evil in there with every with every personality? Yeah, or I did, and and I always think that evil is another one of those words like closure. Um, it, it just sort of it's like shorthand for so many things we can't understand. You know, like how we can't fix what went wrong, you know? So we have a word like closure, you know, cause there's no way you're fixing that murder and not bringing anyone back to life, you know, or changing the tragedy that their life was in the first place that they wound up in Sam Little's car, you know? And, um, it's, 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 it's that same sort of word. It, um, it's like easy, it sums it up sort of that you're looking at something that you like, maybe there's that jerk that you hated in middle school who treated you terribly or, you know, and then you have to like run into them at a reunion years later. Um, and maybe they're different or maybe they're the same and maybe they were a jerk indeed, you know, but there's a difference between that and like, you really are in a monstrous presence. There's a, you know, a, a, the presence of a predator, um, a true predator. Like I, I said, there were just things about it that were so off 
that weren't the things you would think that you would catch. He wasn't like, <laughs> you know, he, that was me for those the listening, devil. holding that up that little devil, that was out of the devil, devil, and devil. Yeah. No, no, I mean, you know, he, he was lovely and charming. And then, you know, he, but he did not like women to talk too much. And he did not like uppity women. So like, if I started to push him, you know, he would be like, shut your mouth or I will crawl through this fucking telephone and eat your lips off your face. Did he literally say that? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I would just be like, I'm just, I'm just a little kitty. I didn't even say anything. You're just big and strong. It's just little old me. Remember me? <laughs> now, um, were all of your interviews through glass or were you ever in the same room with never him? Never through glass. I know, right? I was like, <laughs> I walked in there, whole thing, you know, the giant gate slides behind you, the one opens in front of you, it's like in the middle of the desert, like people are running by in like SWAT outfits, and they're like, hey, nice weather. And and then I find B Block, and I'm totally ready for like that whole scene in the movie with the glass and the telephone, you put your hand on the thing. Had it down. No, I went to the family visiting room because he was handicapped. He was like, ha had different, you know, even though he really, his crime should have merited him not really having just person to person contact. Um, so I showed up and it was like families sitting at tables, like Legos, a, fo a photo booth, um, burritos vending machines all around although i do know enough scumbags that i called a friend of mine who had done time there and he said you must bring quarters for the vending machines or you're not cool <laughs> <laughs> the little things the things you got to learn the little things yeah also don't wear a bra with an underwear you're welcome everybody yeah you'll get the, the metal you, detector you will set go off the metal detector i had to chew mine out because then they were not going to give you a sharp object. No, that's, hey, right. um, <laughs> the other thing I wanted to ask you about was as you started talking to him, everybody, you know, when you look at, because um, when I grew up in Kansas and I was started off as a cop in Kansas, we had BTK, Dennis Rader. Yeah. Um, I actually oh. talked to guys from Wichita about him. And you, you always talk about, they go back and they talk about, they realized at some point in their life they were wired that way. What did Sam say about him? When did he... When did he realize that he was wired this way? Was there anything in his life, any event? You know, what was the what was the predicate thing that started him down this path? You know, it, it's a very like um, it's a very memorized timeline that he has about it. That you know, you know, first there was the little girl, little redhead girl in kindergarten. He couldn't stop looking at her neck. You know, and she would make fun of him. She would she would stick her tongue out at him, and he felt like women mocked him. You know, and then I mean, he was incarcerated by the time he was thirteen for stealing a bicycle in a notoriously brutal boys' industrial school uh, in Ohio. So imagine that whatever cementing some you know pretty deviant. Uh, sexual behaviors happening there and then he came out and he only wanted to be a pimp he only wanted to be a player and he was obsessed with these true crime magazines you know which well that's are, dennis like, Rader. Like that's exactly magazines. where he said he got some of his I mean, ideas for far reading more true graphic, detective actually, things like that in the 50s so yep and it was there was an article about a woman named gloria ferry who, you know, was left some holler with an older man and went to Columbus, I believe it was, and um, it was Columbus or Cleveland. And, uh, and, and this was in 1954. And then she tried to leave him and he strangled her, killed her and, and left her in the park. And there was a search party with, you know, pictures. Um, and when he read that story, he felt like he had found his life's purpose. He cut her picture out of the magazine, put it over his bed, said that was when he figured out, you know, what masturbation was. No one ever told him or taught him before. Um, it wasn't until he learned about strangulation. 
Um, and it just, you know, I mean, really, I think it, strangulation um, and the way Sam described it, you know, it's all about ownership. Then they're mine. You know, I own them. They're mine. Like they need me for their very breath. You know, like that's how powerful I am. I can take away your very breath. And um, if you look at other serial killers, I've also seen a pattern of, you know, shoplifting, starting with, it, yes, starting with lesser crimes, but also, you know, Bundy explained that he would steal things just just to own things some bit that weren't his, you know, just to steal. Um, and I think that if you sort of, Blow that they wanted up to possess. That, that was Bundy too. He wanted to possess them, possess their body. You know, killing. keep keep their heads. Same thing with Ed Kemper. Um, wh- so mm-hmm. when you started getting into this personally for you, how did how mm-hmm. how did it affect your personal life in terms of how you sleep? Did it make you more paranoid about worrying about who's around the corner? Change your habits. I mean, how did doing this affect you? Well, actually, I'm less paranoid and I'm less frightened because what it did was, you know, all of a sudden I'm around all these like members of law enforcement community and I'm like looking at, you know, violence against women and statistics. And was that because so of I, the same, you know, case? I learned to use a gun and I, and I'm damn good. Um, yeah, yeah. I was just like, you know, I, I've like got really serious about self-defense, you know, and about responsible gun ownership too, because, you know, I live here in liberal Los Angeles. So, you know, it's, it's not very popular to be like, I'm a gun owner. Um, you know, but I'm a thoughtful and responsible gun owner. And also I box and, and learn self-defense. I teach a little bit of self-defense when I talk to young women. And I'd like to expand this a bit, but basically what I talk about is awareness at that point, because I'm like, you know, I could teach you how to do like, you know, eyes, mm-hmm. throat, balls, right? But if someone's that close, you're, you lost already. You're not going to win a you're not going to win a fight with a man who's that close to you. You're just not, uh, you know, that, like you like don't watch the movies and see don't wind up in the situation in the first place. Like that's what I tell young women, and I'm like, don't text and walk. How about that? Just like put your back against a wall, look up and down the street, see if you're in a safe position to like answer your phone. I got to tell you, I saw something, uh, a buddy of mine sent me a link um, and it was something he saw on X, formerly known as Twitter, but it it was a husband trying to teach, or I guess a boyfriend trying to teach his girlfriend. They had a kid together. She was on her phone all the time. I thought she was going to kill him afterwards, but she was sitting there on his phone. He snuck up, took the baby out of the carriage and walked away with it. And like two minutes later, she finally gets around. She starts to push the carriage and sees the baby's gone. And it's disappeared. And I thought, okay, that's a hard way to learn a lesson. He's going to learn a lesson too. But to your point, we, we see that that's the thing with personal awareness, self-awareness. We've mm-hmm. seen so many people get wrapped up in their tech. They walk down the street. If, if I'm targeting somebody, if I'm a bad guy and I want to target somebody, I'm going to target somebody who doesn't see me coming. The one I'm concerned that's about right. is the one who makes eye contact with me, tracks me, follows me. Um, you know, those yeah, are life and, and And these, you know, predators can see a victim by their gait in 15 seconds. They can like just tell, you know, with their prey radar, like somebody who has been victimized in the past. Somebody, there's a particular way you hold your body, you know, if you're vulnerable and they're, they're able to find that. So what I have found through working with this is you think that, you know, there'd be more bumps in the night, but actually like, I just took responsibility for my own safety. And so I feel a lot more confident and a lot safer now, Um, you know, and also like that I have resources. For instance, I tell people all the time to call the National Domestic Violence Hotline, right? And I think, gosh, you know, know, because I can't, I can't help everyone, I can't help every victim of domestic violence who reaches out to me because my work touched them, you know, so I'll refer them. 
And just the other day, you know, I have a friend who is in a domestic violence situation, will not get out of it, won't, t- you know what I mean? And I know every single thing she should do. It's like, I have this list for you. Look, I printed it up. I'm like, I'm here sending semaphores. I'm here, you know, and, but you can't make anyone do anything. And I said some, I said something really nasty to her. And I called the National Domestic Violence Hotline in the middle of the night. I did. For the first time in my life. I'm like, I refer people to them. You know, I was like, because I don't know what to say to her. And you know how helpful they were? It was incredible. They really said, like, you know, what you want to do is leave the door open. You know, like for if there's a time, you know, that she's ready to come to you and ready to talk, like you don't want to have built that wall, you know, of shame and, you know, why and, um, you know, like leave, leave the door open for her. And I was like, well, she can't get him out of her house. And they were like, she needs to get out of the house. You can't get him out of the house. You need to get her out of the house. And I was like, oh, right. I work in this field and I had to call the hotline in the middle of the night, you know, so I've learned to reach out for help and that makes me feel more empowered. So I want to circle back to something you said, because Murphy goes back to episode 60, Natasha Herzig. Um, Mm -hmm. We had a real victim of human trafficking on. She was good girl. Family were missionaries. Uh, She fell prey to this. Oh, hey, we think, you know, come to our beauty school, do this stuff. She was kidnapped coming out of a uh, uh, restaurant and trafficked for the next uh, year and a half. I mean, violent stuff was happening. The guy ended up named Spider, ended up getting like 300 years. Some friends of ours uh, from uh, Southern California were part of the case. And you said something, she ended up learning as well too. And I think it's that's an important lesson you talk about. These predators, these manipulators, whether they're human traffickers, you know, or uh, killers or whatever they are, they 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 profile victims the same way law enforcement profiles bad guys. You know, th- that was one of the things, right? Little got very good at was being able to look at a woman very quickly and to determine just in a few seconds, she's a candidate for me or no, um, too many red flags. I'm moving on because it the more red flags, the more risk there was to him getting caught. He needed somebody that fit a certain profile for him. Like you say, marginalized drug user. He was exceptional at that. Like, I, you know, he, and he was absolutely conscious of what he was doing. You know, I, I said, I, I had some hard times too. I'm really glad I didn't run into you one dark night. And he's like, I, I never touch no one like you. He's like, I don't, I didn't touch any fancy New York journalists or governors or senators. I was like, wasn't aware I was a governor or a senator, but. <laughs> Thanks um, for the promotion. Thank yeah. you. Um, but um, he said, I never touched anyone like you. would be all over the papers. They'd be all over me the next day. So I'd stuck on my part of town, leave you in your part of town. You know, he, he was, ve- he was so calculated about it. Did you ever feel when in any of these interviews that he wanted to reach out and just grab you by the throat? Yes. Yeah. Did he tell you that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, um, I mean, they like, there were, there were conversations that we had, you know, things got more honest and, and casual between us as they do, you know, he, he was a human being. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, he was a monster, but he was human, you know? And so we talked more easily with each other by the end, you know, and, um, you know, and he said, I would never hurt a hair on your head. And I said, well, well, now, because you're in jail. And he was like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Jeez. Well, that's comforting. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and he told the Texas Ranger that he planned to kill me, that I would be his last victim. I never, I didn't feel scared of Sam hurting me physically. I felt I felt more frightened of like what I encountered in the world, you know, around Sam, like uh, all the things that orbited him, all the issues, all the, you know, having to look at, look at these women, this population of women, you know, in the eighties in Los Angeles who were like left with their bare asses hanging out on Figueroa street, you know, people were serving like 
way more time for crack and drugs abused in minority communities than, you know, the people doing coke up the street in Beverly Hills. And, um, you know, and, and it just has been, um, That's all I have to say about that. That's it. <laughs> it's, you know what? This is, uh, I, I, I don't want to call this a compliment because it's certainly not a compliment coming from a, a mass murderer like this. But on December 20th at 5.30 a.m., you got a phone call. And who was it that called you and why? Uh, well, it was uh, the, I think it was the, Lieutenant, um, it was the watch commander. I, uh, at the prison, uh, called me to tell me that I was Sam. I'd been designated as Sam's next of kin. Um, and they were calling me to say that, you know, he had died and, um, you know, they were sorry for my loss. I, I didn't even know what to say about that. That was, um, that was very surprising when I read that. I know. I, I, I you know, you almost want to like, st- apologize or you know were you like, aware no. he made you next to ken yes so um except of course he screwed it up <laughs> because there you go there's a psychopath for you yeah i was like you made my life a living misery after you were even dead you um, <laughs> he's still reaching out and messing with people yeah swear <laughs> He filled out the paperwork wrong. It was in the middle of COVID. There were meat trucks in the coroner's office, and I had it arranged to have his brain donated to doctors at Stanford and at UC Irvine, who are the top neuroscientists in the country, who are studying the intersectionality of of genealogy and like brain structure in criminal deviance and they were like we can't get you this brain and i was like this brain is not under any kind of conditions that it's going to be useful to science if you don't give it to me within you know the next three days and it didn't happen so they called me a year later and apologized (laughs) we're really sorry we didn't get that paperwork worked out i'm like i'm really sorry too that like the brain of a really significant criminal did not get to go to science. I'm really sorry. I'm sorry that you thought it was a ghoul (laughs) who was out there with a hacksaw going like, give me that brain. You know, but it was like, I was like, can you see him trying to turn a style's ear into a silk's purse here? Like, otherwise he's just a pile of ashes, right? Um, and that's what he wound up, pile of useless ashes in my, in my garage. Now he's in a storage space. Oh, wow. And we're working out what we're going to do. With are him. you going to, are you going to get rid of the ashes someday? <laughs> yeah. I, yes. I mean, you know, I have also his entire art collection and, uh, everything that was in his cell, um, letters, fan letters, um, to him, uh, just various art, a, a game he invented that is a very serial killery looking game. Um, so, you know, I, I'm talking to different museums and different outlets and seeing, you know, where I could put this that'll do the most good. Uh, you know, because uh, my thing, you know, people are like, oh, you could sell his art for this or that. I'm like, you know, I make money. And what I've done around this, Uh, the story that I told, the work that I did, like not his artwork. Like to me, that's, you know, that, that money goes to a women's shelter somewhere. Downtown Los Angeles, women's shelter is rad, by the way. They're good to be good. Hey, look, we're, we're closing out on our time here and we want to be respectful viewers. Let, Let me, let me leave you with the last word here. Um, you know, like you asked, uh, uh, Mitzi, you know, um, what are you most proud of? So let me ask you, what are you most proud of with this with this book, with this initiative? I'm proud that I fought and finished it. There were so many moments where it almost didn't happen. And uh, and I just in my heart and the thing that comes to mind, you know, the thing I think of when I 
a bird comes and lands outside my window, you know, and you have those magical thoughts, you know, I, I think that it's Alice, you know, Alice saying, keep working, Alice saying, you know, like, remember to be glad you're alive today, you know? So I think, you know, that Alice, solving Alice's murder, which I did from bottom to top, um, is, you know, was definitely um, the most memorable. Yeah, I will say, um, and, we, and we didn't meet until just now when we started doing this interview, but you brought true benefit to our country here in the United States by by taking the time to do this book, by persevering and getting it done. It is a very dark topic. I mean, just one of the most dark, I mean, like you said, the, the most prolific serial killer in the history of the United States that's known, nine, you know, suspected of 93 murders. It's just unheard of. But the fact that you didn't just stop at that, that you've, uh, you're now going out and you're promoting uh, getting help for domestic violence, that you're promoting self-awareness. I've got four kids, and, and we've taught them all to be aware of your surroundings. And just like Morgan said, if you think somebody's messing with you, stop and look at them in the eye. That's been proven that it will, it will work. But So <clears throat> this isn't just you making money on a topic by writing a book on it. You've carried it even further, and you've done some good for the world. So uh, Morgan will say we salute you. I take my hat off to you. I, Thank I'm, you. I'm proud of what you've done, and I wish you continued success Thank in every you, other sir. project you have. Thank you so much, and thank you both for your amazing work as well. Well, the most amazing thing is that um, <laughs> we got through this interview without Murph telling me to shut up. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe we got through without you telling me to shut up. <laughs> no, no, no. You're the guest, you're the guest you're the of honor. And look, what I love too, Murph says, I love the passion you had for this too. It's like. Uh, you know, you obviously did not know what you were getting into when you asked uh, her that last question, right? And then you see where it takes you. It's like going out of the door of a convenience store and say, okay, fine, one last purchase. I'll buy a Powerball ticket. Then you go home and realize you won the $1 billion Powerball ticket. You know, it's like a huge life-changing event. But look, you did um, you did what needed to be done, which is you spoke for those who couldn't speak anymore. Yes. You spoke for the victims. And i very proud that you talk about it the way of the people. I mean, this is one thing that drove Murph and I with these interviews and our, our work too. You know, who speaks for the victims, right? Who speaks for the people that can never speak again? And I'll tell you one lesson I learned. We were doing it, but I mean, Michael Connolly and some of the stuff he did for Harry Bosch is like either everybody counts or nobody counts. And kudos to you. You made sure everybody counts on this. Thank you. I just want to quote, um, oh, I wish I had his name on the top of my, tip of my tongue because he's so wonderful. Uh, uh, tireless cold case detective in North Carolina who I had that conversation about closure with. And he said, you know, truthfully, it's just something that sometimes it's easier to say for the cameras, but really I work for God's children. Yeah. Love and it. I was like, you know, that's, that's it. Love it. All right. Well, this is us saluting you. You guys go to her site, Jillian Lauren, J I L L I A N L A U R E N, JillianLauren.com. Get her newest book called Behold the Monster Confronting America's Most Prolific Serial Killer. And it has a forward by one of my favorite authors, Michael Connolly. Um, and I'm, I'm still watching the Bosch series too now on Freevee, you know, on Amazon. And it's like the, the fact that you're involved with people like him speaks to the credibility of your work and the quality of your work. And we're very proud that you spent this time with us. So and we'll put it on our, uh, we'll put it on our website for you guys. The, the link will be there. And final thought from you, what's the next book? Oh, you got, you got the You're going to be the one. first one who hears this if I decide to say it. Yeah. <gasps> you know, you I want, want to. Uh, you know, I you want to tell us because we're write, nice guys. I want to write a book about hunting. Hunting? I want to write a book about hunting. Yeah. And, uh, hunting and what? Use, well, um, really, I want to I wanna hunt with raptors. That, like, I've always been interested in that. But just hunting in general and, and the idea of predator and prey. Um, and bringing some of that into it. And, uh, I, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tiny little baby embryo of an idea. Really. I just want to go and hunt with some birds, but. Well, I see, a, I see similarities between think looking at serial killers, apex predators, mm -hmm. prey, you know, and, and how in the, in nature, apex predators, you know, how they go out and hunt. So that, that's exactly what I've been thinking, like to try to take, you know, also 
not necessarily like, you know, just, just dive right into the next serial killer, maybe look to something that will inform my next serial killer. We might need to introduce her to Rick Rambo. That's right, Rick Rambo. Is he on? Oh, yeah. Or does he... <laughs> He's in Alaska. Let's put it this oh, way. Oh, yes. I need he to brought meet down an 800-pound grizzly by himself with three shots. From a Whoa. handgun. From a handgun. Oh. handgun. Yeah, he's a stud. Wow. <laughs> Anybody named okay, Rambo totally is a stud to begin with. <laughs> okay. Well, hey, look, Jillian, I can't tell you how fascinating this was. Um, and I appreciate the way you approached it and the, uh, and all the hard work you put into it. And uh, the, the series is great. Um, the, 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 the podcast was great. And your book is great. So Behold the Monster Confronting America's Most Prolific Serial Killers. This is us saluting you. And thank you so much for joining us today. 